And we are back with Nathan Mervo, the former chief technology officer of Microsoft, who has a plan to solve global warming and our energy crisis. Some of this has already happened. There is enough CO2, methane, methane that's been put up in the atmosphere that there's going to be some global warming, even if we were to just shut down every economy today. Mm -hmm. India, China, and the developing world is where a huge fraction of the emissions going forward are going to be coming from. Uh, they have a variety of arguments as to why they shouldn't bear the, the brunt of this. That, you know, we emitted for all, for all this period of time, and until their standard of living is up at ours, we shouldn't complain. Uh, regardless of whether you agree with that philosophically or disagree, the fact is it's their country and it's their things to do. And unless you go and do something by force, which would be insane, uh, the fact is we're not making progress. Now, if we don't make progress, but the problem isn't really all that severe, and we're at the low end of that range, so it's only you know, a degree or a degree and a half, then maybe you don't need geoengineering. But if the temperature starts climbing and some of these tipping point things start occurring, you know, the Gulf Stream stops or the uh, Greenland ice sheet collapses or these methane clathrates erupt or permafrost in the Arctic releases methane, that's another one of these things. If any of those things occur, what are we going to do? And while we're spending, or talking about spending, hundreds of billions and trillions even of dollars trying to attack the problem one way, shouldn't we do some research and having a backup plan? I mean, you, build this wonderful big building and forget the fire sprinklers? It'd be kind of silly. But, but do you think some part of the opposition to, to doing a geoengineering is uh, it's... It doesn't, it doesn't force us to kind of make the painful adjustments. Oh. There is a sort of Calvinist feeling that we need, to, we need to suffer. And what you're providing us with is a way to have our cake and eat it too. So I think there's a segment of the environmental community that has a pre-existing ideology. They're anti-consumer. They have that Calvinist approach. There's another set. They're anti-technology. They say, hey, technology is how we got. L listening to guys like Nathan on technology, that's how we got into this mess. And if we were really this close, maybe they'd have an argument. But uh, I don't think that suppressing a potential solution, particularly the only solution that could get us out of a real pickle, that, the reason I say that is cutting emissions to zero tomorrow won't help us. A, we couldn't do it. We absolutely couldn't do it without, you know, totally wrenching uh, changes to everyone's life and, frankly, killing lots of people. It, you know, in the United States, we could cut back on our energy use a fair amount and we'd be okay. But you really can't tell starving people to cut back. And there's no way to cut back without it affecting starving people. It's another one of the things I that I think some of the folks in this debate don't get is it's one economy. Um, you know, we've seen that in the course of this last year where some guys trading mortgage bonds uh, wound up almost <laughs> causing a worldwide depression because we're all interlinked. If we dra drastically cut back the economy in the uh, developed world by going to zero tomorrow, uh, there's no way that doesn't affect the developing world, and no way that doesn't kill a lot of people. That, that's just the blunt truth of it. Now, there's people who say, oh, we don't have to cut to zero tomorrow. Well, okay, just, just show me the first year where we've decreased at all. Because so far, we're continuing to increase and increase and increase. And I did a calculation recently that in order to have CO2 peak in 40 years, which is the time frame that many people say we need to, we would need to cut emissions by about five and a half, six percent a year, every year for the next 40 years. Well, that means we have to do it at least once. So as soon as we've had one year where we're six percent down, oh, hey, maybe, maybe, we've, maybe we've started. Or even one percent down. Because currently we're just increasing. Increasing, increasing, increasing. So until you can tell me that we really are on a path to this, I think it's crazy not to explore these other alternatives. But the controversy around it is actually one of the reasons that I'm bothering to talk to you. You know, it, uh, this is an area where I think geoengineering has to be part of the debate. Uh, in a uh, society of ideas, in a society that is a democracy, in a world where we're trying to persuade people to do things, 
we have to examine all these different approaches. And if after lots of examining, uh, we discover it's not a good idea for some reason, this feels like, oh, what if there's an unintended consequence? I said, well, okay, but what if we have runaway warming? What if we get the nine degrees Fahrenheit? Then what do we do? You know, the, the trouble is you can't rule these things out prematurely. Um, but for many climate scientists, for many others that would be interested in this, it's kind of a third rail issue. The reaction is so strong and so negative that it requires a tremendous amount of uh, hood spur or a very thick skin uh, in order to talk about it publicly. Were you surprised by the whole climate gate controversy? Is it a tempest in a teapot? What was your reaction to it? I, I don't know that it was a conspiracy. I don't know that there was anything wrong done. But it sure as hell is a blow to uh, how people uh, view uh, the reliability of the field. And it, what it, it's going to mean is that climate scientists everywhere, I think, are going to have to approach this reproducible uh, results thing. They're going to have to go the extra mile to be transparent because the world's a little bit dubious now.